Hello, everybody. My name is Graham Elwood, and you are watching The Political Vigilante. A great way to support the show is to go to patreon.com slash Graham Elwood, where you can sign up to have one of these video uh, discussions on the show. And I very much appreciate it because you all bring uh, interesting ideas and views and topics to me. And I'm uh, happy to introduce uh, Michael Hicks. And Michael, thank you for uh, supporting the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, Graham. So you sent me this very interesting email, and I and I, I was really looking forward to this interview. I'm just going to read. You said, uh, Graham, I hope to discuss my journey from the militant right wing and white nationalism to becoming an inclusive left wing progressive and the dangerous parallels between white nationalism and identity politics. I've never heard that connection made before. So why don't you tell us, you know, tell us your, your journey and, and, and draw this conclusion for us. All right, well, I was born in South Mississippi um, and my family, uh, particularly my father's side, they were hardcore right wing. My grandfather was a Klansman back in the day um, and I was brought up, um, you know, South Mississippi is a largely populated white African Americans, some Native Americans that could be um, really right wing. My grandfather was a Klansman um, and it was almost almost a militia upbringing as far as um, any minute now the government is going to come take our guns and we're going to have to, you know, defend the homeland basically. And I was brought up um, essentially being taught that all of the woes of the United States, everything from the economy to crime, were basically the fault of African Americans and people of color. And being, you know, a child, I was brought up believing that. And as I grew older, just through observation, I started to question things. Mm. Um, because from my experience, just just frankly, I had um, as many negative experiences with Caucasians as I did with African Americans, and I had just as many positive experiences with people of color, whether they were African American, Native American, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm actually, I'm on the autism spectrum and I, I always have a tendency to just observe. And when the facts aren't adding up, I throw it out. And so fast forward a little bit, you know, I was, I was in, uh, initially I was in a public school there. So it was, you know, largely African-American population. And like I said, it was mixed bag, like, like anything, but got in a little bit of trouble and was actually, and this is in the 90s, this is in the mid 90s, like 97, 98, I actually got sent to an all white private school, which for me was just, it, it was what put me over the top, having, you know, gone to school with people of color, white and violent, you know, like I said, for just everything wrong with the country was someone else's fault. You know, the, the African Americans, uh, you, you know, the old welfare queen line, you know, where mm -hmm. the, the, the drain on the system, the drain on the economy, people of color, people receiving food stamps, welfare, things like that. And that was the problem. And as I grew up, I, you know, actually joined the army at 17 and um, was fortunate enough, I didn't see any combat action. But again, you know, with the training and everything, I, I had to throw out that worldview because at the end of the day, even though I was fortunate to be relying very literally for people of other races and cultures to save my life. Mm -hmm. And it, it was eye opening. And, you know, as, um, as I grew older, you know, I, I just kind of watched things and I watched how over and over again, the people in my home state of Mississippi would elect Republicans mm -hmm and so-called conservatives uh, on what I believe to be just the laziest thought process human beings are capable of, which is this is the way we've always done it, so it's not possible to do something different. And what I noticed was time and time again, um, it was the, the, uh, basically the government's gonna come take our gun um, they're the Satanists are facing babies and, you know, it's going to be abortions on every street corner. And it was, it was ridiculous. Um, right. and you know, so I moved to a lot of different, a lot of different areas in my life. I ended up in Phoenix, Arizona, which has, you know, a large Latino Hispanic population. 
And essentially, I still have some conservative beliefs as far as fiscal conservatism and that the whole myth of trickle-down economics and old pull yourself up by the bootstraps. But I was living in Maricopa County, um, which is where the, you know, just absolute criminal Joe Arpaio was sheriff at the time. Mm -hmm. And due to some substance abuse issues and things that I had going on in my personal life, I became homeless. And the next thing you know, I'm incarcerated in Joe Arpaio's jails, which were beyond just inhumane. Right. And ultimately, I saw that you know, this guy that I had been told through the media, through Fox News, through even CNN to an extent, that this guy was um, fighting to, you know, save America from the hordes of criminal aliens, you know, flowing across the border. Um, I saw that it was all smoke and mirrors. The, the truth is that Joe Arpaio, um, you know, he was a basically called up multiple times on breaking the law himself in terms of, in terms of contempt of court. Um, there was a lot of times where huge amounts of money just would vanish from, from the sheriff's department budget there time and time again, detention officers were, were, you know, busted and bringing drugs and things into the jails. And in the meantime, while Joe Arpaio is on the news talking about saving America and, you know, doing all this other stuff, you have, I don't remember the exact number, but somewhere near, somewhere near a thousand unsolved um, sex crimes involving minors. Apologies. Yeah. The so the I don't I'm not sure the exact number, but are in the in the neighborhood of a thousand unsolved sex crimes involving minors that fell under the jurisdiction of the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department were were just uninvestigated. And in the meantime, Joe Arpaio is on television, you know, with Steven Seagal doing his photo opportunities, mm -hmm. you know, driving tanks, you know, so that they can arrest maybe one or two illegal immigrants, undocumented immigrants at a restaurant or something. And so he's just spending an absorbent amount of money for press. And, you know, like an example of, I was actually did about a month in the tent city that he had there for a while. And it's the middle of summertime in Phoenix, Arizona. So it's, you know, well over 100 degrees. And, you know, there we are. We we have the tents. But during the daytime, they would make the tent flaps be up, you know, so that they could see all the inmates. And, you know, I was everyone there had to have a mandatory jail job. So I was working in the bakery. And I come home, you know, come back to my my bunk, if you will, in the tents from the bakery there in the, in the food factory. And I had missed... Um, a photo op that Joe Arpaio was doing with the local media, you know, showing how compassionate he was, you know, handing out ice water to inmates and all this other stuff. Well, you know, it's summertime in Phoenix and there's like, there's like 10 inmates on sick call basically for, for lack of a better term there at the tent, everybody else is at work. The rest of the time that wasn't happens. The only time I ever saw ice water. So it was just a photo opportunity. And so basically he was full of it. Right. And from just right. seeing just the constant hypocrisy of t kind of talking out of one side of the mouth about immigration and defending America and all this other stuff, which, you know, defending America could get behind as far as, you know, I joined the military. I come from a military family. Um, but it was just crap. Like, ultimately, Joe Arpaio did not care about protecting the people of Maricopa County at all. You have all these unsolved crimes because he's busy, you know, doing uh, photo ops with celebrities and, and, you know, making publicity for himself. And the, the conditions in his jails were so abhorrent that to me, like if, if Donald Trump was going to pardon absolutely anyone in the United States, he should make Jaro Pyro last. Because here's here is a lawman with a badge that essentially is running the biggest gang in all of Maricopa County and all of Arizona, because that's what they were. Mm -hmm. uh, you you can see time and time again with the police department of of the whole area, whether it's the sheriff's department itself or like the P, the Phoenix PD, the whole place is the Wild West where the cops um, could care less about civil rights. They absolutely 
you know, I saw with my own eyes people of color with, you know, particularly the Hispanics and Latinos being just harassed, just absolutely harassed, minding their own business. You know, some of my friends were Chicanos, you know, kind of born and raised there in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it is not much of an exaggeration to say that depending on what police departments were in the area, they would have to stay inside, you know, and here's, you know, three or four generations American born and, uh, you know, they're treated like common criminals just because they're brown. Wow. And so when you factor everything together, I just, I, I, I looked at all the evidence from my upbringing and the, the blaming of African Americans to in Arizona, just the treatment of Hispanic and Latino people. And I was like, this, even if I give Republicans or conservative values the benefit of the doubt as far as, you know, their policy ideas or, or um, fiscal conservancy, like even if I give all that the benefit of the doubt, the reality is these people are not practicing anything they preach whatsoever. Right. Okay. And it almost, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the movie American History X, Mm -hmm. Graham, but it was it was a lot it was a lot like that where you have you know the character played by Edward Norton he's a white supremacist neo-nazi guy but when he ends up in prison he sees that they're all full of it and it was a lot like that I mean not quite as extreme but um long story short that's kind of my upbringing that's kind of you know, some of the things I've seen but the um the, so, well okay. I want to touch on this Michael um so then you had that experience in prison and you saw sort of the hypocrisy and the corruption of it. And then when you came out from that, I mean, on as you said, you just kind of said this slow journey, being raised a certain way, but then seeing, wait a minute, you went to the public school, then you went to the all white private school and you started to kind of see this. And then when you, yeah. when you saw the private, you know, the prison system in this country, you really saw how unfair and racist it was. When did you, start, I mean, because you identify in your email as an inclusive left-wing progressive. When did you get there? Right. And when did you like declare that? Okay, so that's that's a good question. So kind of bringing everything full circle back. Um, I, as I said, I was I was brought I was brought up not trusting the government. And and that's one thing that my my upbringing got right is you know, <laughs> I, I don't trust the government and I keep that to this day. So, I mean, it's like the whole broken clock is right twice a day type of thing there. But um, from seeing all this and and watching uh, first with the election of George W. Bush, um, where he just stole the election from Al Gore. And, and that right there was was kind of an eye opener for me. Of course, that was in 2000. But then uh, later seeing um, Barack Obama, who I actually voted for twice. Um, to see him do the same sorts of policies, you know, the exact same kind of stuff, expand our wars from two to seven or whatever it was he did, and to see just the, the whole government machine, the whole corporate machine, um, I started really paying attention. And then when Bernie Sanders was completely just had the election entirely stolen from him from Hillary Clinton, who is a monster, um, when that happened, that, that made me take a hard look at everything. Mm -hmm. And at that time I was, I was really going through a rough patch. I was having depression and things like that. And I was, I was ready to just end it all, honestly, because I, I, I thought that there's no hope. And thankfully my wife, Suzanne, just by sheer chance, she was watching a documentary on the Roosevelt's and it was uh, right around 2017, 2018, when I first really kind of started paying a bit more attention and looking for alternatives. But yeah, my wife was watching the thing on the Roosevelt since I started hearing about the policies of, of FDR and even prior to that, uh, um, Teddy Roosevelt. And it made sense. Like the whole idea of we're all human, we all have basic rights. It, I mean, it's kind of common sense. My my family, you know, growing up in Mississippi, they, they hid behind Christianity. Right. And, <laughs> Where I myself, I, I'm more of a Buddhist than anything at this point. I believe very much in some of the teachings of Jesus as far as just treating your neighbor decently. And so to, to kind of come back to your question, Graham, ultimately, I started exploring. 
you know, like I said, I, I'm autistic. So when I get an interest in something, I, re, I go all in. Mm -hmm. And so I started studying about the Roosevelt's. I started studying, um, you know, uh, Wallace and uh, UEP Long and just this whole movement from, from the 40s and, and, and earlier with what's supposed to be the greatest generation. Like the, the people that stormed the beaches of Normandy to fight fascism, they elected FDR four times. So ultimately, the greatest generation was for these socialist policies that I hear slammed constantly now. And even though I don't like to give a lot of credit to Ronald Reagan, it, you know, I remember seeing him say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And all these supposed Republican, you know, Reagan conservatives are, are now build the wall, build the wall. What's what's going on? But so seeing their hypocrisy and then, you know, studying the long progressive tradition from Theodore Roosevelt on through um, the Kennedys, Eleanor Roosevelt, and uh, even into the modern area with, you know, people like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan mm -hmm. Omar. Um, I'm actually a big fan of uh, Shahid Batar in San Francisco. I think we've got to get Nancy Pelosi out of there. Yep. But, yeah. you know, the, the whole deal is, and this is, this is where the parallel comes in with the identity politics, is that from all of my observation, from all of my study and reading and, and kind of looking at my whole worldview, um, the similarity is this. With white, you know, with white nationalism, this whole thing it's not it's not our fault it's their fault you know whoever they is um in, in the case of white nationalism is people of other races um but in well even even again in the same group you have you know christians versus catholics versus muslims versus sure. jews and it's it's all about sure. keeping us divided and with the the two-party system that we have which is pretty much the the Democrats and the Republicans, um, it's all about blame them. It's their fault. It's not our fault. It's their fault. Nothing gets done. It doesn't matter that we have a super majority in the White House, the House, the Senate, the Supreme Court. It doesn't matter because it's their fault. We I, I realize I'm kind of rambling a little bit there, but it's it's all it's all one big divide and conquer. It's all if it's someone else's fault, I do not have to take responsibility for myself. And with the identity politics of, of you know, the, the pseudo progressive left, it's the same sort of concept. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, there, there absolutely is just inherent bias in, in white people. There's, there's, um, there's racial prejudice just built into our institutions and, and mm -hmm. all of those things are real. And so I don't want to diminish that, but you think people's fault or the white people's fault or men's fault, it's the same crap. It's just a way to keep us divided so that our oligarch masters can continue doing the same old, same old. And rather than having the people unite, because we, we the, the overwhelming population of the United States, we're all in this together, white people, black people, natives, we all for the most part have the same struggles. But when we allow the media to say, well, you know, men always have it easy or white people always have it easy or black people receive all of the programs or whatever the nonsense is, it even if in some even if in some of those cases there, there's a, a bit of truth statement, the overall notion is keeping us fighting amongst ourselves rather than joining together. And, you know, Dr. King famously said that he has a dream where a man is judged not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. And identity politics does not allow us to do that. It basically says, you know, this person, he's evil and he must be wealthy because he's white. Or this person, you know, is, is bad or, or whatever, based on the same kind of stuff, whether it's a religion, whether it's, you know... They're, they're, they voted for a Republican, so they're evil, well, and it's, we can never have anything well, to do with them. Well, it's also, Michael, it's the, that, that's also true, Drew, but it's also like, oh, if, 
if if you vote for Hillary, it's because you're you're for girl power, and it's like you were exactly. you're not looking. It's it's judging somebody negatively, exactly. without knowing everything, and then just giving somebody completely yes. favorable without looking at them. Like I've I've exactly. said this time and time again, if you took a white male Republican with the exact same voting record and donation base as Hillary Clinton, the left wouldn't have gone near him, not even gone near him. No. So it's like. No. Identity politics I, lets corrupt people get a free pass mm -hmm. and then yeah, and incorrectly well. judges the other side. And she is a person of color and a minority faith being a Hindu. So yeah, Tulsi Gabbard, she, yeah. She checks all, she checks all the boxes for, for what supposedly the Democrats want to have in office, but because her policies are so radically different, all that stuff goes right out the window, but we're supposed to give I mean, I know she dropped down a couple of days ago, but we're supposed to give like Klobuchar or Warren a first pass and make them the woman president just because they're a woman. Or like in the case of Hillary Clinton, forget her warmongering, forget, forget everything she's done because she's a woman, we have to elect her. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think so. Like I am all for having a woman president, but I want it to be a woman who has the right policies, not your, your sex parts don't make yeah, your policy and your voting record, um, how you get your money, where you get your money to fund your campaign, that's what matters. And um, yeah, I, I've said this before, like they use the, you know, the, the powers that be, the ruling class uses the Bible and the Second Amendment to keep the right to vote against their own interests. And they use identity politics to get the left to vote against their yes, own interests. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. That's, that's, that's why I loved so much recently when, when AOC, um, when she, she used her faith as a Christian to basically call out the hypocrisy of so many of the conservatives who hide behind the Bible. And, and I thought it was great. That's, that's one of my favorite things I've seen her do in a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fantastic. Well, I, I mean, Michael, man, I really appreciate you, you, you giving us your, your, your journey and your perspective. It's really something that I actually really love about this show is I get to meet all these different people with all these different points of view. And, you know, I did not think when I started the show that I was going to interview a guy that kind of grew up a right wing white nationalist who's now like an inclusive indie progressive and, and to draw this comparison, it was really, uh, I, I really thank you, and it's why I, I, I love doing this show, because I always say, you, the viewers, you're all political vigilantes, because you bring stuff to me that I can bring out to the world that, that just opens people's eyes in a, in a lot of ways. And so, um, thanks, man. Thanks not just for supporting the show, but for being willing to share your story like that, because it's not, not easy, I'm sure, to just, as a white guy, say, oh, you know, hey, I used to be a white nationalist. <laughs> that's, that's, not a, that's not an easy thing to just admit out front. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for your time, uh, man. Any parting so much, thoughts? But uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate you. No, Graham, I just wanted to say I really appreciate this opportunity. And all I would say is to all the viewers out there, think for yourselves. Just absolutely, if it, don't take anything at face value. Do your own research. Question things that you've been taught to believe. Um, it's the bravest thing you can do to question everything that you were to were so that's all I would say. But other than that, thank you for having me, Graham, and I appreciate it. Dude, that's a great that's a great parting thought. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, please go to uh, patreoncom slash Elwood or rockfincom slash Elwood. Like, share, and subscribe. Uh, hit the subscribe button if you have before. YouTube is unsubscribed. People watch the ads all the way through. If you click skip ad, I don't get paid. Uh, and there's a lot of great ways to support the show. Like I said, Patreon, Rockfin, and Ron Placona and I are going to be in Florida. In March, we're gonna be in Seattle and Portland. Portland, April 25th, is gonna be shooting our comedy special. In June, we're going to Louisville and Nashville and Atlanta. And July, we're gonna be in Chicago and Milwaukee for the convention. Get all your tickets at GrahamElwood.com. You're all making Gotham great again. And Michael, shave your knuckles for justice. <laughs>